We would like to get started with uh, the panel discussion. My name is uh, Shinohara Yoshimi, uh, the chair of the panel. To kick off the panel discussion, I would like to ask Professor Wan, who organized today's uh, symposium, uh, to raise some issues after listening to the presentations of the speakers. Thank you for the introduction, O1. It was at a, a university. As we start uh, the panel discussion, I think uh, we must uh, clarify the difference between reskilling and upskilling. Upskilling is not to change uh, the job or the role, but to acquire new skills to raise productivity or improve the uh, quality or speed up. But then, in the case of reskilling, it is the acquisition of skills needed to change uh, the job or go to a different position and role. In the case of Japan, uh, the term reskilling is used in the sense of relearning. So in Japan, it is used in the broad sense, including both upskilling and reskilling. And at the symposium, we use the word reskilling in the broad sense. However, Professor Sado makes a clear distinction between reskilling and upskilling. We heard the keynote. Uh, by Professor Sadden, and based on the results of surveys of U.S. Uh, companies, in order to make a reskilling successful, there must be different strategic and organizational context. That was part of the conclusion. On the other hand, we heard from Daikin, E.ON, and Sony Group. We heard about the three uh, cases uh, then. Upskilling and reskilling were not distinguished. For example, in the case of Daikin, uh, they had the Daikin College of Information Technology, and there were many engineers who studied at the in-house uh, uh, company, so many uh, probably have seen their roles change from hardware engineers to AI engineers, but then the hardware engineers who have learned AI and AI engineers who know about hardware, probably distinction is not necessary in a company. This may be the a fact that because Japanese human resource system is designed to facilitate multi-skilling of their workers. Within the Japanese companies, it has been the practice uh, that employees uh, will be transferred from uh, different positions according to the instruction of uh, the company. So employees will just follow the instruction of work assignment as uh, their employment is uh, guaranteed. So productivity might decline soon after job change, but the employee is protected by seniority-based wages and they would not see a wage drop. So there was not much resistance. So when reskilling is becoming the global trend in this era, I think there are both strength and weaknesses. The strength is, is because positions are not standardized, there is already an incentive to facilitate reskilling in a certain sense. This is unlike U.S. companies because U.S. companies they find it difficult to incentivize their employees to accept training based on the assumption that uh, they will now work in a different position. But in Japan, it is quite uh, uh, conducive uh, to tell the employees to receive a training. But then the weakness is each employee does not decide uh, their own career autonomously, so there is less, less volition to learn on their own. Low motivation could be a major obstacle in order to promote reskilling. And now, as we heard from Daikin, E.ON, and Sony Group, you are responsible for DX. So can you tell us to what extent digital training has led to job transition? Or do you have any incentives explicitly or even tacitly? Do you have any explicit or in implicit incentive to induce job transitions uh, to encourage uh, job position changes in your organizations. I would also like to ask Professor Sadun, uh, PCs spread in the 1980s and 1990s. What is the difference as of today and back when PCs spread amongst individuals? Because of personal computers, many of 
administrative and clerical uh, jobs went obsolete in many organizations. Uh, back then, training provided by company was mainly upskilling, and in fact, there was no concept of reskilling back then. Back then, there was the so-called IT revolution, and today it is the digital transformation. What do you think is the difference? Oh, uh, the environment change is similar, but do you think that the company's reaction is now different? If you have any observation, we would be interested to hear your view, Professor Sardin. So, Mr. Imai. So, uh, when the role uh, changes from hardware engineer to engineer, uh, AI engineer, well, that is what often happens. Uh, so, does that mean that uh, there's a uh, uh, change in role, and uh, is there incentivization uh, that is uh, provided, and uh, would that be necessary in the future? So, Mr. Imai, what do you think? Thank you for the question. Incentives are necessary, absolutely. And talking about incentives, you think of uh, compensation, salaries. Uh, as I said, we started from scratch uh, doing this for six years. After starting from scratch, what we did is uh, to establish a purpose just like Sony. Well, Daikin, gratefully enough, we have new recruits. And uh, they come to our uh, company thinking they're able to be active globally. So for those new recruits, uh, we say that uh, uh, we are a Japan-originating business competing successfully globally. But five years, 10 years from now, we don't know what's going to happen. So we're going to invest in you, uh, the money that we've accumulated. And uh, we want you to be active as uh, business uh, uh, people for the next five to 10 years. I'm an engineer as well as an HR leader. So that's what I tell them. We're going to invest in you so that you can be active for five years, 10 years, and more. And uh, we train people two years. And what we realized is that in terms of objective uh, assessment, so statistics, qualification, IT skills, uh, we look at those qualifications and uh, uh, their pass rate uh, is uh, double or triple uh, the average uh, uh, pass rate uh, in Japan. So they're very competitive. So uh, work uh, environment, uh, work hours, uh, compensation, uh, many of them have to be considered. Uh, but uh, we want them to become pi type people. 100 individuals are all different, uh, but we need them to think what they're going to do, what they're going to compete on. Uh, they may be people who are excel in programming. They may excel in communication. Uh, they're assembled into teams. Uh, they're brought uh, overseas so that they can be active, demonstrate their skills. And existing employees, veteran employees, who have experience of winning uh, based on hardware, uh, they need to be receptive of these new recruits. So we change the mindset, we train the mindset of those existing uh, managers. So Harvard uh, Business uh, Review, Tesla, Elon Musk's uh, thinking, for example, we teach that uh, to our managers. So this is what they've been doing. Uh, they're working on uh, energy storage, uh, energy transmission. Well, that's what they're uh, working on. That could be a threat for air conditioning business. So that's what we teach. Uh, uh, so we provide a, a total package of incentives. Uh, that's all from thank you. Purpose, of course, is uh, important. Incentives are extremely important as well. So Mr. Ono, what do you think? Thank you. At uh, E.ON, we have the retail stores. That's where most of our employees are working. Uh, but uh, job uh, transfer to professional positions, it is uh, open recruitment inside the company, particularly regarding positions in the digital area. They are motivated that they want to be engaged in the digital area. If they wish to engage in digital area, uh, we will have a fair a screening process. In terms of incentive, in the case of incentive, we have examinations inside uh, the uh, company for promotion or wage hike. Uh, employees will have to take examinations. So the wages or the job positions, job area, uh, will go higher. As for the professional positions, we also have a screening system. 
inside our company and employees will go up their career path. So those who comply with the corporate standard, they will be promoted and their wage will increase. And as part of the professional position, the digital aspect will be screened. And as a result, I think there is an incentive to go digital. Mr. Cordera, what do you think? Yes. So incentive to induce a change, uh, motivation that needs to be provided. So on that point, first of all, what I think is that uh, the environment surrounding us is changing. The fact that the environment is changing uh, needs uh, to be understood by both the individual employees as well as uh, the company itself. That in itself can provide incentive. So what is the environment? How is it changing? What I can think of is twofold. Number one, well, Sony, as I said, we have diverse uh, businesses and uh, we operate in a number of different sectors and industries and across the board of late uh, in different sectors, different businesses. There seems to be increasing dependence on the same set of technologies. So same technologies are being utilized in different sectors, different businesses. Just as an example, uh, into this uh, fiscal year, Gen AI started to attract uh, so much attention and utilization of generative AI has started. Before that, data science, data analytics was highlighted and uh, it was cloud information security uh, technology uh, were highlighted. So across the board in different sectors, attention is paid to uh, such uh, technologies. So if we look at the global HR market, there's race to talent. Uh, so in those uh, technological areas, uh, there's race uh, for talent. So that is uh, the awareness of the environment. And in overseas, we already have uh, job-based uh, systems, but here in Japan as well, we are seeing a trend uh, uh, toward job-based uh, uh, systems. So race for talent, a job uh, type uh, system. Uh, by individuals becoming aware of that, uh, they will be motivated to grow. So by riding the way of race for talent, uh, they can expand their career potential. And I think that will provide incentive for the employee. And from the company's uh, perspective, within this environment of uh, Race for Talent, uh, we need to provide opportunity for a broader um, uh, range of positions. Uh, there are digitally skilled uh, people. Containing them in one place uh, is not good uh, for the sake of retention. And if we look at external opportunities, uh, and if we are to hire mid-career hires, it's going to be more costly. So competent uh, talents need to be grown, and by providing the opportunity for mobility, we can continue to retain them so that we can have them contribute uh, to business. So that's the company's uh, motivation. As imai san said, uh, it's not just monetary compensation that counts. So for people who have expertise, what's important is uh, the challenge, the opportunity that they get. They may not necessarily get it in the organization uh, that uh, they belong to. So perhaps mobility needs to be provided for these uh, people so that they can access such new opportunity. According to Kodera san so internal mobility, as the people in the U.S. Uh, uh, say, so internal mobility where employees uh, raise their hand. So not internal mobility coming uh, from top down. It's uh, for each employee uh, to raise their hand uh, seeking internal mobility, and that's the kind of environment that's being developed. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that. Comment on a difference between IT revolution in 80s and 90s and the current di and digital transformation revolution. Yes. So I think that the uh, reassuring note, if you like, is that much of what we are seeing today actually resembles very much what we saw in the 80s and in the 90s. And let me give you just a specific example. Um, if you think about what a bank was uh, before we had access to ATMs, the uh, cashing machine, there are the automatic tellers, uh, you had a cashier, you had a person that would do this job. 
after the ATM came, we had a profound transformation in the organization of banks. You have a machine doing uh, that job, the cashier almost disappears, but you have the creation of a new occupation, which is the greeter, the person that comes and deals with all your accounts and is a very different type of person. Now, all of this is linked to technological change in the 80s and in the 90s. So what we're seeing today has that spirit. And uh, in the 80s and in the, and in the 90s, what, you know, this was my first article after the PhD, we actually found that the ability of companies to exploit uh, these technological um, uh, changes was linked to the managerial quality of the organization. And in particular, the ability that organizations had to promote flexibility and promote talent. That conjunction, I think, is going to be critical here today. We just heard it about the internal mobility. The differences, in my view, are two. First of all, what was a fast technology uh, cycle uh, in the 80s and in the 90s, it's now an insanely fast technology cycle. New innovations and new technologies are being created at a speed that I think is unprecedented. The second point is that whereas in the past we could think of some professions, some occupations as being safe, managerial professions, those that were you know, higher level of white collar professions, with generative AI, one possibility that is highly discussed now is that these new technologies will encroach in the authority of people that have never had that challenge before. And so again, if we go back to what the type of need, the type of change that needs to happen, companies will have to deal not just with the reskilling of employees, but with the reskilling of managers themselves. And I think that this is a different level of, uh, of challenge. So, Professor Sadden, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, it's uh, not easy uh, to uh, encourage uh, employees uh, to reskill uh, one of the results of the survey. As uh, Professor Owan said, uh, here in Japan, career autonomy is not uh, established, and that could is be a major obstacle uh, to promoting reskilling. And in his speech at the beginning of this session, Mr. Uemura, Deputy Director General of METI, also mentioned that in order to promote DX strategy, it's necessary to visualize the necessary skills of digital human resources in order to involve employees. So I would like to ask Mr. Aono, Mr. Imai, Mr. Kodera, what is the most important motivation for employees to engage in reskilling? Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, earlier, but what kind of incentives do you actually provide in your companies? Do you visualize skills and convey messages about the benefits of skill acquisition to your employees? In what ways do you provide opportunities for employees who engage in reskilling? So first of all, Mr. Aono. Thank you. At E.ON, to visualize digital skill, we have the E.ON digital skill check. This is a self-check, self-diagnostic sheet. METI IPA has established the DSS. So based on that, we have defined our roles, the six types. We have 300 companies within the group. And of course, uh, there could be more uh, granular uh, levels that could be classified. But for E.ON group, we have a defined skill set. Furthermore, under the government DSS, by linking our standard with the government DSS, individuals will be able to uh, uh, increase their skill and they would be able to see their own position. By acquiring skills, employees who have received the learning opportunities uh, can uh, work in different uh, positions and uh, they would be able to have uh, the capacity to resolve the challenges. Thank you. Mr. Imai, what about you? First of all, 100 people, 100 people, starting from 2016. 
so grew 360. Uh, we look at uh, each individual's uh, skills from 360 degrees uh, perspective. And for two years, the Secretariat is going to take care of them, uh, training them. And uh, there are those who excel in uh, bringing zero to 100. Uh, there are those uh, uh, who excel in uh, others. And uh, they will start to have uh, dreams of uh, working overseas. What we require, uh, the Japanese management, what we require, overseas management, of course, there are common traits, common skills. And so looking at all of them, uh, we put people in the right position. We've been doing this for two decades, so we need to get that right. And next, I'm working, we're working with NEC on this. NEC, uh, they have lots of different businesses uh, that we can learn from. They have uh, data, they have uh, total scientists top uh, 50 data scientists, uh, what kind of skills do they have? They have uh, the analysis of that. And we are uh, doing this uh, from uh, the first year graduates, uh, 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 those who have uh, graduated two years program and have been implementing for three years. And uh, uh, we're trying to train them further, utilizing NEC's uh, uh, expertise. and. Uh, in terms of incentives, it's the same for air conditioning and chemicals business. Team leaders, uh, a team leader who has up a, a 10 member team. Uh, it takes about eight years uh, since joining the company to become a team leader. And uh, as I said, we're starting from scratch. Uh, so the first year graduate uh, need to be uh, the uh, leaders, uh, team leaders. So year four, year five, uh, those who are trained uh, after four years, uh, five years uh, after joining our company are developed uh, into uh, team leaders. We have 30 uh, people, uh, 30 such uh, people, and there are uh, people below who are being developed. And uh, so horizontally and uh, uh, vertically, uh, we develop uh, people below the team leaders, uh, uh, across the uh, team leaders. And so that's what we're doing. We have 9,000 employees at the head office. Uh, there are 700 uh, expats who uh, work overseas. And uh, uh, 20, 30 uh, people every six months. Uh, we send people overseas in new markets, new regions. We send them uh, to such uh, new areas. They experience new things. And uh, they will experience uh, the strength of uh, local manufacturers. Uh, Chinese, Korean manufacturers, they're ahead of us uh, in new regions uh, such as India and Africa. So uh, we've been uh, competing with uh, such competitors. So we have number one market share in India. So India uh, data scientists, uh, they can get exposure to such uh, data scientists uh, locally. And uh, we provide a program. It takes a lot of uh, uh, care, a lot of uh, uh, time and energy. If it's not uh, uh, interesting for them, they leave. So retention becomes crucial uh, in terms of retention. What's the incentive for each individual? What is it that this individual uh, wants to do? You have to take a close look uh, and provide what uh, he or she needs. So very specific, very concrete. Uh, that's all. Well, uh, Daikin-san has uh, lots of uh, motivated employees. I'm sure that's the case, uh, listening to your remarks. May I ask a question? So first year graduate, second year graduate, people who acquire skills uh, quickly, can they skip uh, those uh, years? Of course, uh, they can. In the initial years, uh, we asked uh, uh, for lectures from Osaka University to lecture. And uh, uh, we also invited lectures uh, from specialist manufacturers. And uh, skipping uh, the lecture, well, train the trainer. Um, um, uh, and uh, so some people leave. Uh, but uh, in terms of skipping the years, 900 or so. Uh, uh, we have Technical Innovation Center staffed uh, with 900 uh, members. Uh, pe people who have spent 10 years at our firm. And this may be difficult for other companies to understand, but 
I said 900. There's one center director, and there are nine deputy directors. They are executives. At age 28, two became deputy directors. And they're not section chiefs, but they are deputy directors. And we give enough responsibility and duty at age 28. And uh, at the first year graduate of uh, college, and uh, uh, they're at uh, age 32, they can become deputy directors as well. So we do provide such incentives. That's a wonderful incentive because lots of Japanese companies are still based on seniority. That's the kind of image we have. And you are different. You are creating uh, specific examples where young people uh, can be promoted. Uh, and I think that will provide strong uh, motivation. So Onodera-san uh, of Sony, so you're growing uh, the individual, you're providing reskilling opportunity. So do you think you have an incentive to m mobilize and motivate individuals? I talked about this earlier. Well, providing a challenge can be an incentive. Reward and recognition, uh, the two need to be combined. Uh, it's not just compensation. You need reward as well as recognition. So if the person is utilizing expertise to perform well, it needs to be recognized. Uh, recognition itself can be an incentive. And as a result, uh, each individual will be motivated to deepen uh, their expertise, expand their expertise to adjacent areas, and they will be given more opportunity to contribute. People live until uh, age 100. So the question is, uh, how can they best utilize their expertise uh, to be active uh, broadly? So the individual has to seek out that opportunity, and the company needs to provide that opportunity. It's not just expertise. So Gen AI, you need to be a good user of new technology. By so doing, you can strengthen your skills, you can augment uh, your skills. Through augmentation of the individual skills, uh, the outcome from that uh, person can be maximized. And for that, uh, the company, when it comes to technologies and tools, they, uh, the company needs to make such uh, tools accessible uh, to individuals. So democratization of tools, I think that is one action that the company needs to engage in. So uh, making individuals into good users of technology, as Professor Sadin was saying, it's not just the management. Employees also need to engage in change management, become change agent. I think that's quite crucial. So um, expert uh, uh, employees, uh, we provide AI platform that I talked about. Uh, so energy conservation, personnel uh, conservation, not just that, uh, but uh, the division that they belong to with the uh, uh, technological capabilities, how could the division change in the future? It's not uh, uh, just for the managers to think about that. It, we need to provide uh, uh, such uh, uh, thinking uh, to people on the ground, and I think that in itself can be an incentive for each individual to think deeper. If I may ask you, Ms. Shinohara, we heard uh, the presentations and we are now engaged in this discussion. As an incentive, uh, there are three more in addition to compensation. One is visualization of the skills. How much skill has been acquired, everybody will be able to see. And then uh, the people can be more active uh, in the public eyes and there will be higher recognition of that individual. And as Mr. Kodera uh, mentioned, democratization of technology. Uh, this was mentioned in the presentation by Mr. Aono as uh, well. So uh, to enable everybody to use uh, the technology or relatively easy to use the uh, tools and technology can be made available and then that would result in augmentation including higher productivity of uh, each individual. According to researchers, the use of generative AI is considered to be useful for the less experienced and underperforming white color workers. So considering that, uh, of the three that I mentioned, uh, technology democratization is going to be quite critical. So regarding that, Professor Sadin, I would like to ask you for your view. 
points, especially the third one is that democratization of technology. So what do you think about those non-monetary uh, incentives for the workers to reskill? I think they're crucial. And in part, it's something that we heard throughout the presentations, which is this connection between learning and purpose. So purpose comes from your intrinsic motivation, uh, but it's uh, also, I think, shaped by what the company tells you. And so what is your purpose as an employee in the organization? And what is the purpose of the organization itself? How are you going to use that technology? Um, I think, in, in, in my view, these are you know, different ways in which you can create the preconditions for uh, motivation. And it's important to focus on what the employees say. I would go back to one of the points that I made during the presentation, which is also related to the organizational context in which the employees are um, embedded. And so in our research, we find that there is huge variation within the same company in the extent to which managers encourage training, including reskilling. And we're finding that uh, the aptitudes of the managers are really important in shaping the aptitudes of the employees. So you have to work from the perspective of the employees, and you need to find a way to make sure that every level of the, of the organization is with you, especially the, the middle managers. So in order to motivate the employees with uh, the need for reskilling, as uh, Professor Seddon was uh, saying, the management, top management, needs to think of uh, reskilling as a strategic imperative. Uh, so uh, that is good practice. They need to engage in such uh, thinking. So the three representatives from companies, how is top management engaged in reskilling initiatives? If you could please give uh, specific examples, in my son, please. So Daikin ICT College, it was led by Chairman Inoue. Uh, so that's what you said in your presentation. So under industry academic collaboration, uh, AI, IoT engineers that you need are developed by yourselves. And that was uh, a main strategy uh, that was supported by your top management. Thank you. As I said in my presentation, uh, the top management, a sense of crisis, that was the starting point. And uh, I was told to think about it. I proposed a six-month uh, program, and I was reprimanded. That's half-baked. They scolded me. It needs uh, two years so that uh, uh, we can develop a paper equivalent to master degree people. Uh, for two years, uh, they won't have to work. Uh, they will only study and train uh, with uh, salaries. As that's what they told me. So top management, executives, uh, they all understand that because they're the ones who proposed this. And uh, competitors around the world, uh, digital companies who compete with us, well, uh, we had a sense of crisis uh, toward them. Professor Sadden, I strongly uh, agreed with uh, what she said. Managerial uh, people, middle managers, section chiefs. Uh, there are those who excel in training their subordinates, and uh, there are some who are not. So for those section chiefs, middle managers, so uh, we uh, train them six months uh, as managers. So uh, it's all right to have dreams and romances. As uh, in order to pursue this uh, theme, uh, use this uh, form, this uh, sheet, uh, to pursue your dream. And engineers are anxious uh, when they're given the task. You know, they're demotivated when they're told, "Oh, leave it to you because you're the expert. You know everything. Just do it." Uh, so uh, top management uh, need to tell what domain they need to operate and give direction. And so uh, that is what we're doing, uh, although we're still in the process. We've been doing this for six years, and I think it's starting to penetrate. And there are those who recognize the work that we do. Kodera-san. So to develop uh, DX uh, people, 
uh, CDO, uh, other non-CDO uh, executives, how are they engaged? Not necessarily just for human resource development, but the first step is that not just HR executives, but chief strategy officer, CSO, a CTO, chief technology officer, working with them because we have a number of diverse businesses. Uh, we need uh, the business context uh, to be understood thoroughly and shared. So before talking about HR, uh, what are the areas of technology investment uh, that we need to cover? That's what we discuss: business context and leveraging synergies, DX capabilities necessary for synergies to be generated. What are they? We confirm that, we clarify that. And after that, if it's Gen AI, we're talking about CTO Kitano and uh, myself, uh, we engage in constructive uh, discussion. What we need uh, is developers or good users? Which is it that we need? Do we need developers or good users? We need to clarify that, have common understanding, because if we get it uh, wrong, we could end up developing just developers without good users. There will be no outlet for the technology that's developed. So CSO, CDO, CTO, the three of us need to engage in constant dialogue with each other. It's not just development, manufacturing. Uh, we need to leverage what comes out of development and uh, by uh, make sure, uh, making sure that there's good use, uh, uh, we think of uh, what human resources to develop. And what I talked about uh, in my presentation, Sony University, uh, the uh, president of that is Katsumoto, and the GM course, general manager's uh, course uh, programming is done by myself, and uh, the a technology, a strategy committee, uh, I run a steering committee. Other than that, I also organize DX Forum. At DX Forum, diverse uh, Sony talents and business talents uh, gather, and uh, we set up uh, joint projects. We promote POC, that's what we do at the forum, several times a year. Uh, members who are engaged in that forum, uh, their activities and the results of uh, such activities are reported to the top management, including the CEO. So we have uh, presentation opportunities before our top uh, management. As Professor Owan said, recognition is quite crucial. So they get recognized uh, in such a forum. So uh, offering that opportunity is something that we make a point of uh, doing. Okay, we're running out of time. So lastly, Professor Saden, let me ask uh, you a question. So uh, for employee to participate in reskilling, what do you uh, think of uh, Japanese uh, companies? Are they different from U.S. companies' initiatives? In U.S. companies' good practices, if there are any Japanese companies that need to learn, uh, please uh, share them. Okay, this is a tough question, Shimi, but anyway, I'll, uh, I'll answer it. So let me start with the positive. I think the positive is we've discussed this extensively. It's important to have companies that have a strong culture that are able to communicate why this is needed. And in a sense, that are able also to communicate to the workers, we are going to take care of you. And this is a strong part of Japanese culture. This is very important. Now, where is, let me finish on where perhaps there needs to be work, not necessarily in this room, but I'm thinking about medium companies, small and medium companies that typically don't really have a very developed HR department. There needs to be a lot of work uh, on uh, promoting meritocracy and flexibility inside the organization. This is still a challenge, not just here. I'm talking as an Italian, we face the same challenges. And this can be also taken to an extreme. In some of the companies that we spoke with, they were very well aware of the fact that the training that they would be providing would take uh, employees inside the company at different levels. They could also take employees outside the organization because at that point they were going to become more valuable. They had new skills. But these companies, first of all, saw the challenge, but they accepted it because they understood that only accepting merit and uh, talent, uh, would, if, they, if they did so effectively, they would be able to attract new talent and they would be able to retain new talent. And so this is a fundamental shift that needs to happen. Professor Sadden, 
Thank you very much uh, for such fascinating remarks and advice. Uh, uh, we're uh, just on the dot. Uh, uh, time to close. So let me bring the panel discussion to a close. So Waseda University, a reality uh, joint organized uh, a symposium, a digital uh, reskilling uh, challenges uh, and opportunities. Thank you very much for participating in today's uh, symposium once again.